Okay, so just to summarize very quickly on page 143 here in the chapter about prayer, chapter 11, we're speaking about the need to have what we call in Hebrew kavana, which means concentration or focus in prayer. The reason for that is because as the Talmud states, Rahmana libabai, God wants the heart. And uh, when we come with an open heart and even with a broken heart to God himself, then that that in and of itself already opens the gates of heaven and our prayers go straight to God. A prayer without heart is a prayer that is sometimes gets stuck along the way. I remember that Rabbi Steinzeltz sometimes will point out in different synagogues that I've been to with him that um, this roof is very special. The roof of the synagogue is very special. And I would ask him why. And he would say that's because a lot of prayers are stuck there. <laughs> and I'll continue. <laughs> and I'll continue onwards to the heavens. And usually those are the prayers that are without concentration. And um, I think it's true in every relationship. If prayer means connection, like we said, right? The word for prayer, tefillah, in Hebrew means connection. It does not just mean prayer. So if we are really in seek of a, a connection with God, of a true relationship with God, then a relationship can be robotic. It's got to be it's got to be a heart to heart uh, relationship, so to speak, and that's really what concentration does. Anyway, that was the last point we made on prayer. I mean, there were many many other points that were made on prayer. Remember the false pregnancy illusion, for example, and how one uh, also needs to um, write their own prayers, not just say the prayers of a sido, for example. But um, let's continue at the bottom of page one forty three. Does anyone want to read? How can we pray? So the question, right, is how do you achieve kavana, as we said? Does anyone want to read? Please, anyone. Okay. I'll yes, go. please go ahead. How can we pray with genuine understanding and feeling? How can we engage in the worship of the heart that prepares our soul to pray? There is no certain formula, no guaranteed mechanism. However, there are methods that can at least point us in the proper direction. Here we shall discuss three. Right. Okay. Three methods on how to achieve kavanah, how to achieve true concentration in prayer. Let's start. Let's read here the first paragraph of method one. Go for it. First method. Yeah, continue. Just oh. a little bit more. The first simplest and perhaps most natural technique has been suggested by a certain sage. One should pray, he said, in the same way that one quarrels. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One says a word, the other says a word until things get heated. This approach does not require preparation before prayer. One simply takes the prayer book and struggles with it on all the points that we have discussed. Understanding the words concentration and consciousness in relation to and about truth. One toils over every line of text. Every word, every part of a word, attempting to squeeze some meaningful kernel out of it. In addition, one struggles over the question, am I merely repeating the words of others? Or is this something of particular relevance to me? Right, and that's the quarrel. The difference here between just understanding the text and quarreling with the text is that when you understand the text, your relationship with the text is very cold. You're understanding it. Okay, this is what it says. But God wants, again, as we mentioned before, God wants the heart. God wants emotion. God wants connection. And that's where the quarreling comes about. Quarreling, as opposed to just reading and understanding, means that your entire heart is in it. That you are quarreling. It, it's important to you, and therefore you care about it, and therefore you dare also argue with it. And therefore you dare also use it sometimes as a language of protest to God. But that's exactly what prayer is. Um, not just understanding God. I'm saying, oh, okay, fine. All right. You want me to check these boxes? I'll check these boxes. Oh, this is the way you operate. God wants a relationship. Imagine you have a relationship with someone and they're just robotic in that relationship where <laughs> everything's dry. Oh, that's what you do. Okay, fine. Yeah. And they're more, like, more or less like, like slaves to their masters. That's not the type of relationship God wants us, wants us to have with him. He really wants us to have, as we said, a heart to heart relationship you know i think that's one of the great differences between judaism and other religions if you think about islam christianity and judaism the three major religions we have a very different relationship with god islam means to subdue and that's because their relationship with god is like a relationship of a slave to their master where they are subdued whatever you say yes god 
then you have Christianity, which more or less sees that relationship as a father to his son or son to his father, right? Uh, it's a more maybe uh, um, special and maybe deeper relationship, but it's still, there's an authority and then there's a subordinate and uh, uh, yes, it's a relationship of love. It's a relationship of different fluctuations, but uh, it's not that ultimate type of relationship because that ultimate type of relationship is the way Judaism sees the relationship we have with God. And that is that we are not just slaves to our masters. We are not just children to our parent in heaven, but we are also partners. That's why the word for mitzvah in Hebrew does not just mean commandment. Mitzvah means partnership. It comes from the word sevet, unit, a partnership. That's because we are partners with God. And God wants that partnership to express itself in all of the realms of our lives, especially when we speak with him. If I am having a meeting with my partner, that meeting might include some arguing, some quarreling. But that's what partnerships are all about. If I'm having a meeting with my slave, ah, oh, there's not going to be any argument there. It's different. Or even with my child, right? But but or sometimes with my child, yes, depending on the depth of the relationship. But same year. There's no, there's no, like with the slave, there's certainly no quarreling. With 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 partners, there is, but that's part of the depth of the relationship, the heart to heart relationship, and that's exactly what God wants us, wants of us, in prayer. So when we come to prayer, come not just with your head, but come with your heart, and that is also why you know Hasidim would pray in all sorts of different ways. I think that's one of the great differences, by the way, you see between churches and synagogues. In churches, everyone has their own little space and everyone has, I mean, not that I have too much experiences with, uh, but everyone is more or less stagnant and and there's not much movement. Uh, in synagogues, especially in Hasidic synagogues, which take this message to heart, you might have one person banging the wall and you have another person that's somersaulting. That well, used to be the case. I'm not exaggerating here, really. In Hasidic synagogues, Used to be another person moving his hands and shaking, another person sweating, and another person even shouting at God. Uh, go to the Western Wall and see how things go there. There you'll see prayer, real prayer. That's what God wants of us. Rabbi Steinsatz would often say, by the way, that he wishes that synagogues could be more like black churches, like the African-American churches, <laughs> where they sing and dance, and it's so Thank passionate. You. But that's that's what it's about. That's method one about concentration. Yes, in Elizabeth and Khan. Right. Excitement. Right. I mean, they're arguing, you know, people don't realize that at first when you go, they yeah. die, oh my God, angry. That's right. That's but right. They're just so but it's passionate. That passionate. And it's part of that relationship. And by the way, the 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 you know, it reminds me because the Hebrew language is fascinating. You can tell what the culture of a language is about based on how many words they have for that for that um for that specific thing that you're looking at so for questioning do you know how many words we have for questioning in hebrew slash aramaic because the talmud is in aramaic 24 words 24 words for questioning for questioning why because that's what we're about we want a real relationship we're partners with god remember right so we quarrel by the way, do you know how many words Eskimos have for snow? Twelve. Twelve? I think eleven. Eleven or twelve words. Eleven, eleven words. That's from what I read. Maybe twelve. But again, because they deal with snow all the time, so they have a lot of words for that. So again, the number of words you have for something is reflective of what that culture is about. So our culture is about questioning. So we have 24 words for questioning because indeed, that's, that's what it's all about. But what's fascinating too, Elizabeth, I, I will add, is that this questioning... Is not personal. When two people are fighting over a text, it's not, it's not, oh, you're an idiot. You don't understand what it said. And it's not personal. They're fighting for that which is greater than them. They're fighting for God. They're fighting maybe against God, with God, for God. But it's not personal. And because it's not personal, it never ends with tension. The opposite. It ends with love. Almost like a couple that are not becoming personal in the arguments. They just really want to tighten their bond and 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 align their vision. So they argue. But it's not about them. It's about their common vision and their home. So it almost always ends with love. 
arguments like that can't end with with tension. So that's that's what's special about it. But yes, Hannah, what did you want to say? Let's say that the Almighty of our services is the last few days that were there was so much passion right. and so much love. And we just um told someone to each of the Sharia and they said, What do you think of our service? He said it's very different in Israel because in Israel they're very much into prayer with no nothing. But I thought the service was excellent. No, and, thank and you. Yeah. Yeah. Like the little kids were running on the Duma. And to me it's like and some people are like, don't let them do that. What is your thinking? Absolutely. We invited them on the Bima. They don't just run on the Bima. Right. When they do the Shofar, when the Rabbi, we must have had, what, 60, 70 kids on the Bima? Yeah. And I remember when it can be a million. So, right. No, Baruch Hashem. It's, it's, it's the work we, we all do and we continue to do. And like I said last night to a group of people that you know, it's nice to pat ourselves on our shoulders and so on, but uh, I think we missed the point if we do that. No. Because I wouldn't stop by a house in PV or anywhere else that's under construction and say, oh, what a magnificent house. It's under construction. <laughs> Can't judge it yet. We're under construction and forever. Until every Jew will be touched, we're still under construction. Construction. Mm -hmm. So, so, so yes. But I, I do want to mention the kids because that's an important point. That's another difference we see amongst, you know, between synagogues or specific synagogues and others or churches and synagogues all together is that because we're all about this heart and this life all together, then children take the center stage. Children are hearts, walking hearts. Children are walking lives. And in many ways, we also want to contage, I don't like that word, but contage our children with a love for Judaism. That's what it's all about, with passion for Judaism. And the mothers with their babies, Granddaughter, you know? Right. It was just so, I mean, to me, because, you know, you know, right. you know yeah. it was just so, I cannot describe how wonderful the service is. Oh, thank you. Thank yeah. you, Khan. We should have Yom Kippur. We should have Yom Kippur 10 times a year. <laughs> yeah. I will take a moment. And then, <laughs> I, I, I see what you said. So well, uh, I, in. I just walked in and I did not miss it. So okay, good. I'll, I'll tell you a little secret. Some people take naps in my breakout session. You can, <laughs> you can combine the two together. We all knew each other. Right. Sitting with our little old man. Yeah. And then he said, I just want to make sure that I sleep. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, okay, but thank you for that, yes. So anyway, that's one method, and Rabbi Shnazia continues to elaborate on this method of wrestling, of quarreling, of putting your whole heart and soul into it, right? Uh, let's continue, unless, again, there's other comments, questions. Feel free to speak your minds. Yes, please, Sue. I remember you said that when you pray, you should pray out loud. Right. But during some services, some of the prayers is silent. Why is that? Oh, that's a good question. So when you pray, you should pray out loud. You should actually verbalize the words, not just think them. Right. You bring them into this world's reality. It, it has many benefits, right? And we spoke about this. But some prayers are silent. It doesn't mean that our words are silent, that we're not speaking them. We are speaking them just in a, a whispering way, right? Like the Amida prayer, for example, right? That's what you're referring right. to. So some prayers are silent. Uh, for multiple reasons. One major reason is because silence, as opposed to what the world may think, and I know you have that in music, right? Silence is actually a reflection of the deepest parts of being. Uh, when, for example, if I am hurt, if I am hurt just a little... I shout, ah, if I'm hurt a little more than, ah, 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 I can barely utter anything. If I'm deeply hurt, I can't even say anything, right? It's true with hurt, it's true with love, it's true with music, right? Silence, it's the silence between the notes, as Debussy said. And in a way, those parts of the prayer which are silent are reflective of the depth of our relationship with God. It's so deep, so profound, so intimate that it's silent. 
That's what the Amidah prayer is about, really. The Amidah is a one-on-one -on -one meeting with God. It's the most intimate part of the prayer in which we are encouraged to pour our hearts to God, not just with the prayers in the Siddur. We can add our own prayers. For example, there's a prayer asking for healing. We can add in that prayer specific people that need healing. And uh, same with Shema Koleinu, hear our voice. We can add any, our, any one of our prayers that we think uh, should be brought to God. So it's an intimate meeting with God. That intimacy is reflected by the silence of our cry, of our connection altogether. Yes, Linda. So in this paragraph that we just read, yeah. um, you know, I think that when we're praying, it goes actually from intellect to heart. That, that I don't think that, because I think where we are in our intellect takes us to a certain place in our heart. Mm -hmm. you, you know, um, and I think sometimes you, you go to a different place in your heart with the same prayer, depending upon like where you actually are. Right. I'm not sure if it's where you are in your intellect or where you are in your heart, but I think the two are connected. That, right. That, you know, I don't think that our, our cognitive being um, is not aware of the words we're saying, but I think we take it on differently depending upon where we are. Right, it's true. And and that also is the ideal state where the intellect should arouse the heart, not the opposite way. By the way, that's you'll see soon as part of met method two and method three also. Maimonides speaks about that type of method where we contemplate first God's creation. Just to look at Camelback Mountain, for example, already arouses its love towards God uh, in our hearts because we see his magnificent creation in Camelback Mountain or in whatever. It doesn't have to be, I don't know, we have to go to Camelback Mountain to see that. You can look at a leaf, you can look at a worm on the floor, and you'll see that too. But it's the contemplation and the meditation of that creation of God that arouses our love and maybe even our awe towards God. So yes, that's the way it should work. Intellect igniting the heart, not the heart igniting the intellect. And, and the best quarrels come from that perspective too. Uh, it's I fail to understand something, but I'm so invested in that something that my heart also comes into play. Um, but you're right. So that, that, that's a good, good observation. And I would say that that's the ultimate type of quarrel. Right. Okay, let's continue. Bottom of page 144 here. The success of this method. <clears throat> Anyone? Uh, anyone? <laughs> Unless, Mindy, you want to continue. Okay. Whatever. No, okay. No, you can... <laughs> Go ahead. The success of this method depends on cons consistency, extended focus, and effort. This is quite difficult to achieve, particularly since the prayer service does not have the homogeneous texture. It has passages in which we throw ourselves on God's mercy. Remember his miracles and thank him. Experience elevated joy and engage in humble self-reflection. Mm -hmm. Each of these is a different stratum of feeling, a different chain of internal experiences. It is hard enough to enter into a sustained mood how much more difficult to accompany the words of the prayer book, ascending and descending as they do. So that, for instance, we recite the Shema Israel with the consciousness of standing directly before God with no intermediate, how did you say that? Intermediary. Intermediary, right. Then immediately afterward. Right. In the Nefilat Apaim, that's how you say that, yes, right? You. Yeah, supplication, which okay. means supplication, yeah. We descend radically from divinity into created reality. This is the nature of the entire prayer service. It moves from one extreme to the other, ascending and descending, which makes extremely difficult demands on a person's psyche. Right. And that's why that uh, investment of our emotion becomes so difficult because so many fluctuations in prayer. Just to fine tune this a little bit, uh, not that it needs fine tuning, that's the wrong word, but just to uh, elucidate this. Uh, there are, if you if you pay attention, you'll see that in especially in the morning prayer, there are usually three category, cat categories to prayer. In Hebrew, they are called Hodaya, Shevach, and Bakasha. Hodaya means gratitude, and that's 
how we begin the prayer by being grateful to Hashem for all of his blessings. The first blessing that the Chazan leads us in is Hodul Hashem, right? Kirubishmo, which means be grateful to God and call his name. So that's one category. Another category is the category of Shevach, in which we praise God, but not just grateful, but we also praise him. And that's the category of Yishtabach. Yishtabach means, may his name be praised, Shevach. And then the third category is the category of Bakasha, in which we request God, or we request all sorts of requests from God. These are three different categories. So if we're speaking here of different uh, fluctuations, yes, there is the gratitude that gives birth to specific emotions, emotions of thankfulness. But then you have praise, which gives birth maybe to emotions of awe, of being uh, astounded and and in many ways also um, humbled. And then you have the the third category, which is the category of request, which now gives birth to a whole set of other emotions in which we become almost uh, intimate with God, where we feel like, okay, we can ask things. And that gives birth to emotions of intimacy, emotions of, um, of, of, I would say, compassion also, emotions of other things that, uh, that relate to that third category. So within prayer, we can jump from one emotion to another, and we can have an assembly of some 20 emotions. So it's hard to jump from one state of emotion to another. And that's what Rabbi Steinzel is saying here. Maybe this is also why the Baal Shem Tov would famously say that when one uh, prays, um, uh, he should know that he might not come out alive. And uh, therefore, sometimes after you pray, you should be grateful to Hashem that he saved your life. Okay. Why? Because prayer should be such a, an exercise, an emotional exercise that is so taxing, on the other hand, so also reinvigorating, right? Let's not forget. But still, that person can expire in the middle of prayer. Is, is that why uh, he used to say that um, people cannot start, start studying Kabbalah until they're in their 40s? Yeah, well, that's different. That's a little bit different. And I want to differentiate here between prayer and study. If you think about this, prayer and study are really two opposite things. Prayer is when I am trying to reach God. Study is when God is reaching me. God gave me the Torah on Mount Sinai. So it's a different direction. Uh, so when God reaches me, yes, I also have to be prepared. And that's where the study of Kabbalah comes about. And that's when I have to be mature enough and receptive enough and to be able to receive that Torah. But prayer is actually my own exercise. And that's why it's so much more dangerous too, right? It's me doing all the investing, all the exercise, all the emotional uh, uh, investment or engagement. And that's really why it's so, so difficult. And this is what this is saying. Now, one who prays in this, in this way, then after prayer, you usually feel two things. One, you feel a sense of true reinvigoration or cleansing because you went through every emotion and you filled it with divinity. But on the other hand, you also feel exhausted. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why, you know, there's many stories, many Hasidic stories about, again, Hasidim praying. Who would do this? Who would do this? They would pray with their entire emotions. But this is also why sometimes Hasidim, after prayer, they would need at least an hour of, of rest, something like that, mm -hmm. in order to transition back to this world. And that's what prayer should do to us. Uh, but that's also why, by the way, just, just to add, that some Hasidim had methods within prayer so that they wouldn't lose it completely. It wouldn't expire. For example, Rabbi Elimelech of Lijansk was one of the great Hasidic masters of 250 years ago. He was the brother of the famous Reb Zusha. Both him and his brother took upon themselves the suffering of the Jewish people. How? By going into exile. They went for a whole year, and some say more, into exile. And that meant that they would travel throughout Poland where they lived. And they wouldn't stay more in one place for more than one night. There are many stories about their, their voyage throughout Poland. But Rabbi Lemelech of Lijansk, when he would pray, he would look at his watch. And most people, when they pray and they look at their watch, we know why, it's for, why they do that. 
<laughs> but uh, when he looked at his watch, it was ready to ground him back into this world because he's all over, all over the heavens. So he had needed something to ground him back to the dimension of time. Yeah. But Kana, what do you want to share? Okay. That's right. You were exhausted from prayer. <laughs> Very good. You prayed well. <laughs> yeah. But that's the idea. Um, so so if we can get, uh, why are we learning this? I don't know if anyone is on this level. Maybe, surely, many of you are. But if, like me, you're not yet at that level, I think it's to teach us that at least we can try and attain that level by focusing maybe not on an entire hour of prayer, an hour and a half of prayer in a sense, but at least five minutes, 10 minutes of our prayer should be minutes in which we have completely divorced ourselves from this world and thrown ourselves with our mind and with our emotions, all of those different emotions into God's world. It happened to me in my last services on the Kippur. It felt so powerful. And after the prayer, I was just... Right. I just cannot, you know, for me. Right. Right. No, it's true. I think Yom Kippur also is staged in such a way where it's almost as if God does uh, some of the job for you. He... He sheds your shells and he embraces your inner core. And then it's easier for the inner core then to really be fully revealed and fully engaged. Yeah. Okay. Anyhow, so that's that, That's the fluctuation of emotions here. Uh, let's continue. Again, unless, please, feel free to speak your minds. If there's any other questions. I just want to uh, explain. I know some of these... these um, um, uh, words written in italic fonts are not translated. Shmonaisri refers to the Amida prayer that we were speaking about, where we are speak, you know, praying silently or whisperingly. And the Filata Paim is the prayer that comes after the Amida in most during most weekdays, in which we the Filata Paim literally means that our faces have fallen. The fila means fall, and a Paim means faces. Our faces are fallen. But it's a prayer of supplication in which we confess our sins to God. And we say, Ashamnu, Baganu, Gazalnu, and so on. And we ask for forgiveness. And that's why we're kind of ashamed. We fall. Um, it's also a time in which we, we cover our faces. I mean, according to many of the customs, we actually cover our faces and we bow down a little bit. And the reason we do that, just to go into the details of that, it's interesting because buying down, we find that during the Yom Kippur prayer also. There are times where you bow down completely on the floor. The reason we bow down is because if you think about this, um, in all of our interactions, who's at the center? Me. When I engage with people, I'm, I'm in the center. When I'm on a Zoom, I'm in the center. When I talk to people, I'm in the center. We even think or empathize with others based on first asking ourselves consciously or not how we would feel in that situation. So it's even, even when we empathize, we're self-centered. We extrapolate our th thoughts in order to feel what the other feels. Oh, he just fell on the floor. That means he's in pain because I would feel in pain. So, so even then, we're at the center. Buying down is putting yourself and your ego completely down to make someone else take the center stage. Who? God. For the first time, God can be in the center. And when I get up, I hope to see the world then from God's perspective, not just from my perspective. That's what Nefilata Paim should achieve every day. That's why that's part of the of the prayer. Another reason, more, more technical, technical but still very kabbalistic when you bow down your head and your feet are on the same level every part of the body really represents something else the head represents the intellect and the feet represent action very often we act based on our intellect we think this is good 
and therefore we'll do that which is good. Whatever our mind tells us to do, we want to do. At least we want to, we want to be at that level. We want to be led by logic, by rationality. On Yom Kippur and during the Nefilat time, we say, you know what? Sometimes we have to go beyond logic. Some things are illogical, but it's what God wants us to do. Whether I understand them or not, I'm putting my mind aside. I'm going to put my mind and my feet on the same level. And I'll just do what God wants me to do. So that's more from a technical standpoint. The mind and the feet are on the same level. But again, the idea is that I'm submitting myself to God's will completely. God becomes the center stage. And that's part of prayer too. That's what Nefilat Apayim is on a deeper level. Where I fall down. Not just to fall down. Not just because, again, that's what also prayer should do. It exhausts me, right? Like we said. But also so that I, I make God the center and I let my ego disappear. Yes. Supposed to be like a piece of paper or a piece of cloth or something on the ground. They don't fall directly to the ground and keeps you not on the ground. Right. So yeah. Down. That's right. And there's a halachic reason for that, actually. It's a very legal reason for that. And that is because we don't want it to appear as if we're, God forbid, buying down to a stone. Stones have become part of the materials that idol worship worshippers use in order to. They worship stones. They worship statues made of stones, idols made of stone. So we don't want it to appear that way. And therefore, we put a carpet or something else. So that, again, we're not buying them to stone. So at least it doesn't look like that. Yeah. But yeah. The Latin Constitution had a you know. Uh, yeah, the Spanish Portuguese synagogues have, exactly. have, what? have like this sand. 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 Yeah. Okay. If you go to like Amsterdam, there's a Spanish. Even in Coraso, there's a. there's. There's a Spanish Portuguese. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Sand. Yeah. Very much for that reason, too. There's other reasons, too, but it's to remind us that, you know, there's deeper reasons. Abraham said, that towards God, he's but dust and ashes. So it's a reminder of that. You know, it's interesting because many of the architectural aspects of synagogues represent really something much deeper. The sand in Spanish Portuguese synagogues also represent that nullification, that I'm but dust and ashes. Abraham said that about himself. Towards God, I'm but dust and ashes. I'm just his conduit. I am, my ego is dust and ashes. So when we enter a synagogue, we should have that perspective too. And the Spanish-Portuguese synagogues want you to remind you of that perspective. Want, want to remind you of that perspective. So the floor is made of, of sand. But, um, yeah. Why dust and ashes? Why afal? That's because uh, that's the base of our creation. Adam was made of sand. When a person dies at his or her funeral, we say, You came from dust and you're returning to dust. And it's to remind us that really, no matter how big our ego is, no matter how much it can achieve, at the end of the day, everything that the ego can achieve is temporary. Everything will be really reduced to dust. No matter how many cars or mansions or whatever, everything will be reduced. But there's one thing that won't be. Anything that you did that was divine, that was eternal. That stays eternal. So when you did good, that becomes eternal. When uh, we did mitzvahs, that's that's eternal. That That's not reduced to dust. So in a way, it's a reminder of that too, the sand and those synagogues. Okay, anyway, that was Nefilata Paim. Let's continue on here. 145. A person's thoughts. Does anyone want to read? And maybe you can continue. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, please, Elizabeth, go for it. Go. A person's thoughts tend to be random and easily distracted and can quickly shift from the holy to the profane. We must work hard to keep our minds focused. We must struggle with all our minds. This battle to maintain proper concentration has no clear end. If a person's only goal were to recite the words as written, he could succeed with a certain amount of time. But struggling with the prayer experience, plumbing the meaning of word after word, sentence after sentence, is a never-ending process. Sometimes a person may apply himself purposely, mm -hmm. but if he applies himself repeatedly, his efforts may be in vain. 
Our tradition refers to prayer as a time of battle. In this battle, as in any other, one may lose. Right. Uh, in, yeah, that's right. It's a battle. Now, uh, there are methods within this method, right, to maintain that focus, maintain that concentration. Sometimes, like he alludes to here, is repetition. I repeating a word or repeating a verse or pasuk. Now, by the way, I caught Rabbi Steins off doing that many times. That during the prayer, you repeat a verse to focus on it more and more and more. And sometimes, whether their repetition not only allows you to focus on the meaning of the word, but each time you repeat it, a new meaning is revealed and a new meaning. And that's why some Hasidim could have, I remember Mendel Futifas praying. And I remember his repetition of the word, Atay Echad Vashim Echad. You are one and your name is one. And he repeated it and repeated it. And he's in complete ecstasy. He's not even paying attention to what's around it. But he's repeating that verse, repeating that verse. You are one and your name is one. And I'm sure that with every repetition, like a new light, a new meaning came to it. So repetition is certainly one method, like he alludes to you. Sometimes repetition doesn't help. And sometimes you lose focus. That's the human nature, right? Our minds float everywhere. Um. It's reminiscent of uh, this <laughs> this story. I don't know if it's true, but it's an anecdote about it. also another Hasidic Rebbe who was once approached by his uh, a student, a Hasid of his, a Hasidic Jew, who said to him, look, I've had this battle with my landlord who thinks that I owe him money that I don't, but he keeps telling me and demanding and he keeps threatening to kick me out. Uh, but miraculously he hasn't spoken to me about this for six months and i wonder like if i should continue to be worried or not so the rabbi said to the student let me ask you is your landlord jewish he said no so the rabbi said that means he doesn't pray the amida prayer right he says no it's not true he doesn't pray the amida prayer he says then you have nothing to worry about because these thoughts only come during the Amidah prayer. <laughs> He's not going to remember that uh, he has this beef. <laughs> That's how the mind can float all around, right? Uh, so it's it's sometimes a big problem. But but the repetition helps. And I think another thing that helps, a method again within the method here, is to visualize the words themselves. That's why it's so important, and we mentioned this, to pray from a Siddur. Sometimes, yes, your mind will take you somewhere else, but if you affix it to the letters themselves, then uh, you'll be you'll have much uh, much more of a greater chance to to focus and to concentrate. Kabbalistically, I will add that they say that the Hebrew letters themselves carry their own energy. Why? Because as opposed to other languages, the Hebrew language was designed by God. Aleph looks like an Aleph because God decided that this is how it looks like. Bet looks like a Bet. That's how God drew that letter. So it's God's letters. God's letters, therefore, have divine energies. And when I am focused on those words, completely focused on those words, I see them, I visualize them, then the divine energy comes and permeates my being. That's on a more mystical level. So that's another method. Repetition one. And again, focusing fully on the letters themselves and being receptive to the divine energy. That also helps. But we have to acknowledge that the mind flows and we have to work on that. Yes. I feel like somewhat, I don't mean to use them with secret, but I'm going to use them secret. Yeah. Secret messages in the letters with respect to the numerology associated with Right, letters. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the letters themselves have so many significances. One of them is the numerology, right? Aleph equals one, Bet equals two, Kimo equals three, and so on. Sometimes it's the shape. Shape. Uh, for example, Aleph. Let's go to Aleph. And we can speak about every letter. But Aleph is really composed of two yuds. One yud above, one yud below. And a line in between, a vav in between. And this refers really to God above and God below. And my task to connect the two. That's the vav that connects the two. To make sure that the heavens and the earth are connected. That's my mission in life, your mission in life, everyone's mission in life. That's Aleph. Bet is, Bet means house, home. What makes a home a home? A home that's, yes, focused on its inhabitants, but always has a door wide open. I have to invite guests. 
my hospitality, my kindness is what makes a home a home, a bite. So even the shape of the letters, we can go on and on, but even the shapes of the letters also mean a lot. So, so again, they have a lot of significances and energies, and that's why it's so important to focus on them, right? Okay. Um, uh, any other questions or, or, or comments or disagreements? <laughs> All right. Yes, Daniela. Okay, Okay, and you said you can train all languages. Yeah. English, Italian, whatever language. <clears throat> and, and you don't, I mean, you don't understand the Hebrew, and you said it's so important to read the Hebrew and you understand the letters. How, how can you connect? Right. Well, you can, you can still, uh, even if you don't, let me just clarify, which is a good point, because even if you don't understand Hebrew, if you can't read Hebrew, you should still focus on the words. Just to focus themselves on the words helps with concentration. If you don't understand Hebrew, look, there's two things. First, you can look. <laughs> what? Learners. Yeah, yeah, that's the other thing. That's exactly number two, what I was going to say. <laughs> so let's start with number two. Number one, learn it. Exactly. <laughs> and by the way, I think, right, one of the Shlichim is teaching Hebrew right now. Yes. Right. On Tuesday night. So thank you. So Tuesdays at what time? Five o'clock. Okay, so Tuesdays at five o'clock. Please come and study Hebrew. Five o'clock now. Yes. Right. But that's he's uh, wonderful. Excellent. Good. Yeah. And he's teaching like all levels, right? Yes. Like there you go. Yes. yes. Okay, there you go. Yes. And by the way, the Shlichim are available to study Hebrew with you also one on one. So that's that. But let me just go to set the uh, uh, that's method two. Yeah. Method one is even if you are not, not yet at the level of, of understanding Hebrew or recognizing Hebrew letters, you can always compare. So when you read some English, you can say, okay, which words did these translate? And then just look at them and then go back. You can do that too. Yes, Kana. Speaking of classes, uh, we have an amazing class on Thursdays at 11. We've been studying for quite a while. Mm. And we studied with Ishai, the old Shalia, but now we're studying with the new Ishai, mm. which he misspells his name. But that's okay. <laughs> and we're going to start after the holidays. We're going to start uh, learning the capital. Very good. Pages of our fathers. Right. And in the entire, all the stuff that I've always learned and I've been learning, it's my favorite class. Mm -hmm. So I encourage all of you if you're interested. Um, Thursday. Right. I have a class to go already love it. Right. We, I think we're studying about uh, probably support. Okay, excellent. Thank you for plugging that in. And uh, I do want to find a connection to this. As you'll see, method two or three, I think is studying Torah. That helps because at the end of the day, if you think about this, prayer, as we said, is connecting with the divine. So studying Torah is also connecting with the divine. It elevates me to the plane of the divine. When I find myself in that plane, then I'll find it also easier to connect and therefore to pray because I'm already elevated to that plane. So Torah study certainly helps. And that's why, yes, please join at class two at 11 o'clock on Thursdays, it will elevate you to the plane and then prayer will also become easier or that challenge, at least in prayer, will become easier. It's a question not just of whether mind is focused on, but I think it's a question also of where the mind is altogether, what the mindset is. If your mindset is a divine mindset, then automatically makes it easier to pray. But if you're thinking about the food or uh, materialistic things all day long, then it makes it much harder to pray. Study in a way draws you away from that. So study is another method that, of course, Rabbi Stanis will focus on. 